Throughout his time in the Game of Thrones, Ned Stark was the archetype of the man who was fundamentally honorable, to the extent of being a personification of the idea itself. When it comes to familial matters, Ned demonstrates honor in his compassion to his family, his courage to fight for them, such as his participation against a tyrannical king in the form of the Mad King, and in his generally selfless attitude. In regards to his duties to the realm, he demonstrates honor as he follows his role with an enthusiastic poise. He does what is expected of him, even if he is reluctant to do so, but he will for the sake of keeping the peace. He does his duty. In regard to ethics, he demonstrates his honor as he believes that there is a right way to handle situations in a manner that is compassionate and peaceful, such as him disagreeing with the notion of killing Daenerys and her child at the opposition of the members of the small council. Honor can be described as an individual's quality of character relative to society, those qualities usually being valor, chivalry, honesty, and compassion, all things that are very apparent in Ned Stark. His honor to his family is a pronounced trait relative to the societal norms and to the social cultural aspects of noble houses in Game of Thrones. Those norms tend to be quite different from the conduct Ned accords himself to and the way he treats his family. When you observe the familial relationship between the Baratheon brothers Stannis and Renly, with Renly who was so keen on gaining power that he excused his lack of birthright to go to war and usurp his older brother, it shows a glimpse into the holistic trend of family dynamics in the series. You have Stannis who went so far as to kill his brother with blood magic for standing in the way of the throne. Albeit his brother had essentially made himself his enemy, but this is only to emphasize the often chaotic and cold nature of family dynamics. There is the Lannister family, with Tywin as a good contrast relative to Ned as a father figure. His treatment of Tyrion as a whole, with a major defining moment of that relationship being Tywin's setup of the Taisha incident, set Tywin up as a father that is lacking completely in compassion to a helpless child, willing to break his heart for the sake of teaching him a lesson that wasn't necessary or relevant, but simply as an excuse for him to be cruel. This contrasts very well with Ned as both men raise children whose birth had killed a loved one. Yet one decides to love the child, and the other expresses unfair disdain and cruelty. But not only Tyrion, his relationship with his children, besides arguably Jaime, are not loving relationships. Tywin is less concerned about who they are, and more about what they can do to establish his legacy. Whereas Ned is more open to his family's emotional needs. The Viserys treatment of Daenerys is another familial dynamic that is worth mentioning to emphasize just how much Ned's treatment of his family stood above the regularities in Westeros. His desire for acclaim and status outweighed any genuine care he had for his sister, even saying he would let the Dothraki army have their way with her if it would get him the crown. This is not something a loving sibling would ever entertain. Lastly, there is Balon Greyjoy's denouncement of Theon altogether when Ramsay sent him a letter containing, well, you know what Ramsay sent him. After this, he saw Theon as a failed heir as he could no longer establish a family line. He had no emotional ties to him. Rather than seeing his son as someone worth saving, all he saw was a boy who could no longer produce heirs, opting to forget about him. The list goes on and only reinforces the sense of honor Ned had to his family. Rather than view them impersonally or as tools or inconveniences for his legacy, he saw them as people, and his own people. Relative to the status quo, Ned stood as a man above men. His familial honor was arguably most pronounced in his role as a mentor slash father figure to Jon Snow. Though Jon's life was not the best, as he was still treated harshly by Catelyn Stark, as she forbid his allowance at any noble gatherings, and as his status remained as a bastard rather than switch to Trueborn, Ned still gave him a place in Winterfell, trained him with his highborn children, mentored him, and educated him. He treated him well. Major spoiler alert if you haven't seen up to Game of Thrones Season 6. Given the truth surrounding Jon's actual birth as the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna, in contrast to what Ned told people, Ned essentially lived with a trueborn Targaryen and rightful heir to the Iron Throne, a child that has the potential to rally usurpation against King Robert. If we think from the perspective of nobles who are not Ned Stark, I believe that one of their first thoughts would be to see the child, Jon Snow, as a threat to the kingdom that must be killed to not undermine Robert's rule. Or there is a possibility that one could see Jon Snow as a gateway to power 
that they could use his claim as a way to rally Targaryen supporters to their side. Albeit, the latter is likely a less practical outcome as most people were anti Targaryen at this point. Break faith. Your father burned my grandfather alive. He burned my uncle alive. He would have burned the Seven Kingdoms. My kingdom. father was an evil man. Essentially, most families would see John not from the perspective of family, but from the perspective of politics. Another notable relationship is the one Ned had with his daughter Arya. Highborn children are expected to do their duties for the family, often regardless of what they want. When Arya said that she wanted to learn to use a sword and become a knight, rather than put his foot down and destroy the fantasy she had in order to establish Arya's duty to become a lady, he was more open to letting her explore what she wanted, even if it went against societal expectations. To Ned, her emotional needs are more important to him than the cultural values of nobility that often stamp out displays of compassion. My granddaughter, Wertha, Walra, Waldina. I'm married. Fine. If this were Tywin Lannister, Arya would be made to do her duty by force. If it were most other lords, it would be laughed off and not taken seriously. But Ned makes it a point to place a priority on his family's emotional needs. They are not just pawns to satisfy his ego for legacy. In fact, it is this relative lack of ego that makes him such a rarity in the series. This treatment extends to Sansa, though while not as emphasized as it was with Arya, Ned still decided to opt out of a marriage with Joffrey regardless of his king's demand that they be wed, saying that he would get her someone that would be good for her as opposed to Joffrey. Legacy or passing down things from his own name is not pronounced or noticeable in Ned's desire out of his children. He values teaching them what he knows. He values displays of compassion and love. He values teaching them to be honorable and he values them as sovereign beings. Another pronounced trait in Ned, relative to the other lords of Westeros, is the honor he has to duty and to ethics. I would say that his honor to ethics is most certainly what eclipses his honor to duty, though Ned likely views duty and ethics as things that work for one another. Season 6 spoiler, when Ned confronted Arthur Dane and the Kingsguard as they guarded the Tower of Joy, even though their absence in the Battle of the Trident played to his advantage towards victory, Ned could not help but question why Dane wasn't there to protect his prince, regardless of his advantage in the war. From my perspective, who really cares about why he wasn't there to protect the prince? Is he not my enemy? What do I care about judging his duty for when a supposed abandonment of duty played to my gain? But for Ned, this is a different matter, as honor to one's duty is a backbone to Ned's characterization and perception of things as a whole. The way Ned views the world, Arthur Dane and his men are Kingsguard, and as Kingsguard, their role relative to what is expected of them by law is to protect the king and heir. The way Ned views the world, structure and one's humble adherence to it is what keeps the world ethical. While it can be argued that Ned abandoned his loyalty to the Mad King, the King had breached ethics, and thus, to Ned, breached his duty, which made Ned's rebellion with Robert more righteous as he was avenging his family and preventing further needless bloodshed. Then we're no better than the Mad King. Careful, Ned. Careful now. To really perceive the value of Ned's perspective in this story is to try and glimpse into how Ned values honor as a concept. Honoring one's duty in society is interlocked to the honoring of ethics to Ned. To Ned, an ideal world likely involves everyone doing their duty to keep the peace and to avoid chaos and conflict. To Ned, ideally, everyone's participation is in service of keeping things together and promoting stable quality of life. As a result of this worldview, we see Ned vindictive of those who lack honor to their duty, as shown when he sentenced the mountain to death as well as ordered Tywin's arrest, as shown where he criticizes Jaime of being a kingslayer even though the king he slayed had gone mad, likely Ned's most hypocritical judgment. It shows in his overall disgust with the politics in the Small Council and Red Keep. Ned honors where his duty lies, which is usually to other people, and he views most people who abandon their duty as self-serving. This lack of honor to duty is pronounced in the title Game of Thrones, as it is essentially a game to most people, and much of the time, it isn't team-based, even though it may seem that way, given how many in the series are meant to be allied to their respective houses. People forgo these qualities in an attempt to play the game and achieve individual prosperity for the most part. It's not an uncommon occurrence where those who are tied in vow to certain houses, or those who are sworn by oath in certain positions, 
that they partake in shady and unethical behavior to advance themselves. A great example of the latter in those sworn by oath is shown in a character like Jano Slint, who was a highly ranked person but whose duty was to the best bidder, regardless of the ethics of the situation. While his loyalty was to the hand of the king, Ned, who was now named protector of the realm, he betrayed him and killed his men for the authority over Heron Hall. And as I mentioned before, there is Renly Baratheon who dishonored his brother and unethically started a war against him for what was Stannis by right. The heart of this game, however, is likely embodied in the character Peter Baelish, who has max XP in the Game of Thrones beta. To thrive in Westeros, it is more valuable to be cunning than to be honorable. To treat it like a game, because honor is not important to the people who participate in the game willingly. Peter Baelish seems to have maxed out his cunning while taking no action in the honor department. People like Tywin also serve as an archetype for the person who prioritizes cunning over honor to duty. Or at least honor to ethics, as it could be argued that Tywin honors his duties but while excusing unethical means. With them as major players in the game, this reinforces the next aspect of Ned's characterization relative to Westeros. Ned is a rigid and stubborn character. I've made many mistakes in my life, but that wasn't one of them. Oh, but it was. Ned is a character that is unfit for politics due to his high degree of rigidity and stubbornness, shown in the sense that he is unable to, or perhaps more accurately, unwilling to accommodate his sense of what is right in order to abide by the political sphere of influence. Even though a level of accommodation to the political sphere is crucial to the game he's found himself in. Probably the best display of this riskiness because of his stubbornness would be the challenging of Joffrey's claim to the throne against Robert's wishes to make him a suitable king. While honorable, as Joffrey was unfit to rule and was not of trueborn blood, to challenge the Lannister family and to completely deny Joffrey's claim like this in light of the Lannister's political sphere of influence, it is very dangerous and puts him and his entire family at risk. It was practically stupid. It's probably safe to say that Ned had zero XP for the skills necessary to play the Game of Thrones well, and that he would have made for a terrible king in Westeros regardless of his honor to his duty. This isn't to say that Ned doesn't have qualities that many would see as ideal relative to what would constitute a proper king. Ned is ethical, lawful, and resolute in his decision making. But in a world like Westeros, where the need to manage relations with so many houses and so many power-seeking individuals runs rampant, where accommodation to the often irrational nature of politics is essential, it's not effective in Ned's case to be so unwilling to adapt his personal sense of honor as king for the sake of accommodating to the politics that keeps the country running and relations stable. Without that ability to adapt to the agendas of others, you will end up caught by surprise by the culminated efforts of their secret agendas. Most people who play the Game of Thrones well would have accounted for particular factors before making a decision as drastic as the one Ned made and those factors will be the consideration of the ulterior motives of the people around them. As a subtle contrast to Ned, we see this ability to adapt and understand people's ulterior motives when Tyrion told Varys, Littlefinger, and Pycelle his plans for his niece Marcella, telling them different locations and to not tell anyone to see where their loyalties lie. To see the stark contrast between Tyrion's actions here in regard to Ned's mindset, I wish to highlight a quality about Ned that showed in his chat with Varys when he was in the dungeon after denouncing Joffrey as heir. When Varys proclaimed that his blood isn't what he wanted in light of Ned's skepticism of his visit, Ned responds with the comment, I don't know what you want. I've given up trying to guess. In King's Landing, this is an incredibly dangerous mindset to have as pretty much no one does things with selfless interest the way Ned does. This rigidity of Ned is pronounced in Ned's son who he passed this trait down to in spades. Rob, who lost the Karstark army as he prioritized his lawful duty to kill the head of the Karstark house, rather than flexibly maneuver the situation to get what is in his best interest, King Joffrey and his head. Had he taken the time to consider the motivations of the people around him, such as considering that the Karstark army may not be motivated to his effort, but to their house and to the head of their house, then he would have been able to come up with a more flexible solution. Instead, Rob made it clear that rather than placing the interest of others as a priority, that he would sacrifice the better part of his army to selfishly preserve his honor. He did not heed the wisdom of his counsel and stubbornly prioritized his honor, 
not understanding that people are concerned with their own self-preservation. Ruse would have never betrayed Rob had Rob made decisions that put him on the winning side. If networking, these sorts of mistakes are mistakes he would be making every week, and many people would likely conspire against him for these mistakes. This is as seen with Ned sentencing the mountain to death after being told about his crimes he commit in the Riverlands, burning down fields, homes, taking and killing women, and burning children. This action to absolve him of his titles and sentence him to death was very honorable and it can by no means be disputed that the mountain did not deserve this. However, what makes this a rigid move on Ned's part is that the mountain is connected to the most powerful man in Westeros, Tywin Lannister, who Ned foolishly demands to be present at court or be branded an enemy of the realm. Tywin Lannister, who is also the father of the queen and who the crown owes 6 million gold. Not understanding how much other major players rely on Tywin, he created chaos and made himself a target by going after him. While this was an honorable move, Ned's rigidity shines in the scene due to the ridiculousness of his demands of Tywin given his influence. Ned is too willing to sacrifice his adaptability so he can adhere to what he deems as ideal behavior, when as a king, one must be adaptable to play the game of politics. Those in King's Landing participate in a symbolic game of chess simply by their virtue of being highborn and by virtue of being in King's Landing's political sphere. Ned has essentially opted out of playing the game even though he has already been placed on the board. By deciding to overlook guessing the motives of others, but still insisting that he had advanced in on the king both literally and figuratively, he is essentially a blundered piece as he has thrown himself into enemy fire without the consideration of their counters. It is absolutely commendable and brave that Ned is willing to do what is right because it is right. But when you're thrown into the fire and your family is at risk, it is much more efficient to be willing to adapt to other people's perspectives and motivations rather than stubbornly adhering only to your own morality. It is admirable and respectable to fight for what you believe in no matter what, and even those in King's Landing maintained a level of respect for Ned even after his death. But in the game of life and death, when you play the game of thrones you win or you die. There is no middle ground. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a like as it is great for my channel's visibility in the algorithm and will greatly influence its growth. Also please be sure to subscribe if you enjoy analysis related content for ideas and media ranging from TV shows to books to music to movies and anything else under that realm.